This is Daryl Simmons, and you know I got soul. Daryl, I appreciate you taking the time out for this. Um, You know, a lot of history, of course, with you in the industry. I'm real tight with uh, Tim and Bob, and when I told them that I was interviewing you, they had a million stories to share with me about their time, you know, just working (laughs) with you, getting to know you, and we can get into all of that, but again, just... Yeah, great guys. Absolutely. And then, as well, Tony Dixon, he wanted me to say what's up to you as well. Oh, yeah. Yeah, Yeah. I love that dude. Yeah, that dude's so talented. Yeah, all of them. Yeah, Yeah. all of my guys. Absolutely. Go back, for sure. For sure. Absolutely. I'll be honest, Daryl, as I'm going through your discography, I'm trying to figure out how I want to do this because there's just so much history to touch on. But I guess in in most recent news is um, Babyface. Obviously, he had his tiny desk. Uh, yeah, he had a great. lot of records that uh, <laughs> yeah. you helped write on there. Like, just what is that feel to know that some of those songs that you were a part of, they still live on to this day and people are living it reliving it just discovering it for the first time and just loving these songs uh you know for me it's great because a lot of these kids weren't born when can we talk came out or superwoman you know baby 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 so as a songwriter that's where i get my joy is to see people loving these songs singing the lyrics that you know kenny and i wrote uh that's that's my joy that's my payoff so uh, it's been great because it's been, especially with Can We Talk, because I, that's, right. everybody just loves that song. It's like, it's just, it got this surge all of a sudden, and they had a Can We Talk challenge, and, you know, Tevin's been out there singing, and that song, everybody loves that song. And it's a good record, but to think, I don't know what year that was, 93 maybe? I can't yeah. remember. Yeah. <laughs> but think about the kids that weren't born, but when that comes on, people just lose it. Yeah. It's they some... lose it. Yeah. It, it's something about that record and a lot of the records that you've done. Uh, but I want to take it to the early beginnings here, Daryl. T- kind of talk okay. about your early days with Kenny and writing songs together. Like, how did that even come about? Because, like, for people like us that grew up watching you guys, everything was mm-hmm. documented. But, like, I'm just curious, like, how did you guys even get into the practice of writing songs? Um, I met Kenny. I was 15. He was 14. I actually played in a band with his brother. He had an older brother who played a little bit of guitar. And it's actually how Kenny learned to play guitar because he would sneak and practice on Michael's guitar when Michael wasn't around. So I played in a band with his older brother. We only played instrumentals and we didn't have a singer. And I was asking Michael, hey, I heard your brother could sing. We should get him. And he always just kind of, you know, nah, nah, we don't need to get him. Nah, we're good. And I couldn't figure out why he didn't want to get his younger brother. Right. Anyway, he was kind of, he was hating on him back then. He was a hater <laughs> back in those days. Right. So finally we had rehearsed at this guy's house and I was breaking down my drums and up walks these two guys. One was a manual officer and another one was Kenny Edmonds. He said, Hey, how you doing? So you guys, you, you're in the band with my brother. I go, yeah, you're Kenny. He goes, yeah. And he just had a cool look and, you know, we just kind of started talking. He goes, well, you should join our band because you're more like us. And I go, yeah, you kind of are. Cause his brother was older. Right. And so all the other guys were older. And so I played drums and I was the youngest. So I immediately quit that band and, <laughs> you know, joined Kenny and Emmanuel. Uh, and, you know, I, I learned that he had this, you know, thing for wanting to write songs. And so did I, you know, uh, but what I discovered was, <laughs> and I tell people all the time, I thought I had a little bit of talent, but when I met him, I was like, oh, he's really talented. Mm -hmm. (laughs) I identified, I said, he's really talented. I'm not nearly as talented as he is, but we clicked as friends and we both had the same drive, ambition, the the passion for writing songs. And I learned to write with Mm -hmm. Kenny. I learned to write from Kenny. It was really like an apprenticeship for me because what I thought I knew wasn't really that good and he had he just had a knack you know and that's all we did our band never played anywhere we just had a band we hardly ever played so we'd walk to my house and work on songs then we'd walk back to his house and work on songs then we'd walk to the store and get some snacks and donuts and chips go back to my house and work on songs right and so we just had this love of wanting to 
write songs. And when I turned 17, I bought a piano because he played guitar and wrote from guitar. I said, well, I can't really write from drums. So I bought this piano. I put it in the layaway back then. I'm showing my age, right. <laughs> paid on it for forever. <laughs> right. And they delivered it. And my mom says, what are you going to do with that piano? And I said, I'm going to put it in the living room and I'm going to write songs. She goes, no, you're not. And I said, well, what can I do with it? And she said, you can put it in the den. And Kenny and I pushed it through the grass, around the house. And the two of us got this pen, probably ruined it. We didn't know any, any better. And we got it into the den. And we just started, you know, just trying to write songs. And that's how our songwriting started. And we never stopped. I mean, here we are 50 plus years in our relationship. Yeah. And we just had we just had this passion, man. Just wanted to write songs. Didn't know we could make money. Right. Didn't know we'd be successful. We just wanted to write songs. And that's what we did. And we never stopped. <laughs> we never stopped, you know. And, and it's a beautiful thing, Daryl. But I want to touch on what you talked about earlier. Like you identified pretty quickly on that baby face had this knack for writing this talent like when oh, i yeah. listen to, when i listen to your guys's record what i've always appreciated um you know the structure is great i love the structure that you guys mm -hmm. have but it's that and i can't even put it into words it's like you guys know when to use certain words at certain times the, absolutely the, the hooks are always big and then it transitions yep. into the bridge. I mean, is there a science yep. to this? Like, was this something that Babyface kind of taught you or was this kind of something uh, you guys yeah. figured out? Yeah, that, okay. that was something that he taught me. Then eventually I caught on and said, okay, I know what we need to do. Yep. So I could sit there and know where he was going. And I would, people would say, well, when you're with Babyface, what do you do? And I yep. said, I write lyrics and I connect the dots. Right. I can sit back and, and say, because I know him so well, I know exactly where he's going. I know exactly where he's going with this thing. And we both have that same feeling of where it's going. And he'll be on the keyboard up here and I'll be in the back in the chair. He'll be like, what'd you say? I said, oh, I said this. Uh, Did you like that? I go, yeah. I said, that's great. Do that again. Okay, cool. And so we just have this, you know, that chemistry of just, he says that he can think of something if I'm just sitting in the room and not wow. saying anything. He says, he'll think, he'll think of something. Then he knows I'm going to think of something. So he's Batman. I'm Robin. And that's how we've always worked. He's always got an idea. I think he writes the most wonderful melodies ever. I'm biased, of course. Right. <laughs> but, you know, he and Stevie Wonder. And but he, yeah, it's just something that we get in the room. We know when it's supposed to, like you said, it's supposed to build. We know when the bridge to come. We know if the bridge is too long. You know, we just kind of know. You know what you know when you kind of start doing doing it for a long time you know and so uh but yeah he is uh he is very masterful to this day to me he works on a song today like he's never had a hit record wow. and that's what i always admired and i got that work kind of ethic when i broke off on my own yeah and his thing was never quit try to make it better don't quit is it right. good okay read it back okay let's leave for two hours go get something to eat and come back let's play it is it good we feel like it's good. We're like, okay, can it be better? Okay, let's see if we can make it better. We may not can make it better, but let's try. Yeah. Because I tell songwriters, once it's gone, once you let it go out into the universe, yeah, ain't no pulling it back. So you better love what you've done and spend that time. Because people will say in the interview, oh, is there a song that you've done that you would change this or you don't like? I go, no, <laughs> because, because I already did that. We already did that. We made sure that wouldn't happen. So if I hear Fairweather Friend, if I hear My, 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 if I hear whatever it is, I can turn the radio up and go, you know what? That's a good record. That sounds good. Right. And there's nothing I sit and say, oh, I wish I had had Tony do this or I wish I had had, you know, you know, a Chili do this. It's not we already did that before right. we let it go. And so that's always been our, our way. And even when I work by myself, I'll work on something and I'll say, what would Kenny say? Mm. I said, would Kenny like this? Would Kenny say this is strong? Would Kenny say this is clear? Would Kenny say this is clever? Because that's where I get it from. You know, this, this one girl in the interview some time ago said, oh, I really love your style. I go, well, I don't have a style. Mm -hmm. My style is Kenny's style. Right. <laughs> you know, so I don't try to say 
oh, my style. No, my style is what I've learned from Kenny. So Daryl Simmons doesn't have a style. He's an extension of Kenny. You know, right. that's that's what my style is, you know. Uh, so, like I said, it's uh, it, it's just something that he I can go to Los Angeles. We can work on a song and love it. Right. By the time I get home, he'll call. Hey, I, I wrote the sec rewrote the second verse. I said, really? Wow. <laughs> he goes, yeah. I said, it just wasn't as strong as the first. Let me let me sing it for you. I go, damn, Kenny, that is better. Just that quick. Wow. You know, because he's always chipping, always grinding to make it better. Even if it's not successful, it doesn't mean that it's going to be a hit. Right. You know what I mean? Uh, Return of the Tender Lover, his album that he did a couple of years ago, maybe three or four years ago, yeah. was some of one of the greatest bodies of work, yes. I thought, yep. and it failed miserably. Yep. And man, we worked on that thing for months. And I was excited. And I still love that album. I still love oh, yeah. those songs. It's a good album. Sits on my desktop, I'll hit standing ovation or I'll hit. I say, damn, that's such a great song. Just didn't catch on. Yeah, because it was yeah. that album and it was the After 7 project that came out. The After 7 project, mm -hmm. one I think, did a lot better, but just that body work at that time. That was that mm -hmm. was a great time for Babyface and leading leading up mm -hmm. to that even the uh the joint album with Tony Braxton. Like that was mm -hmm. pretty cool just to see Babyface come back and just do what he does and of course you're in the mix mm -hmm. as well. So uh but Daryl, I wanna touch back on this and, and when I think about what you just said, you know, you make sure that the song is completed and you feel good about it before you let it out into the world. It's a huge stark contrast to what we see today in, in music where rough drafts almost are immediately uploaded into streaming platforms by these mm -hmm. younger artists and um, mm -hmm. you know in a sense it works because you see these streaming it numbers does. go up but it's like how do you kind of look at that as, as someone that kind of has a different approach to it like cause, well and, and the structure like I said what I've loved about your structure is the bridges the, the long drawn out you know, process of getting to from point A to point B, but now songs are like a minute and 30 seconds long. It's it's all different. <laughs> well, it's just different. There's no yeah. right or wrong way. As long as you get there and it's successful, there's no, you know, I'll listen to records and I, you know, my producer ears will go on. I go, man, I would have done this or I would have gone back to that part or I would have faded on the hook, but it doesn't make the song not a hit. It's just right. something that I would have done that kids you know, they, it's their, it's their vision. It's their right. expression. That's how they saw it going, you know? And so, but it's, the song will still be a hit. Yeah. You know what I mean? doesn't change it. That's just me riding in the car saying, oh, I probably would have done this. I probably would have went back to the vamp. You know, oh, I probably made that a little bit stronger, but it works. And so I don't, I don't have a problem with it at right. all. I think it works. Right. Yeah. And I'm looking behind you and I see all those plaques. And, and what's really cool is, like you mentioned, you guys wrote a lot of songs, uh, you know, collectively, individually. Some of them became massive hits. Some didn't. Mm -hmm. But I think what mm -hmm. I appreciate the most about you is the output, the amount of music that you guys put out during that mm -hmm. period. And that just lets me know how much you guys worked during that time. Like, mm -hmm. at what point we did... Worked. What at what point during your career did you kind of say like this is this is my option like this is my only option I'm not looking elsewhere this is my career <laughs> that must have been pretty early on because you guys put in the work early yeah it was uh we went to Los Angeles in '83 and once again Kenny says we have to try we have to go and see what we can make happen because it's not going to happen in Cincinnati it's not going to happen in Indianapolis and so literally it was like okay let's go. So he, L.A. and I, the group went, the deal went. They were there, too, for a while. But one by one, they all went back to Cincinnati. Right. And, and we all stayed. And, and everybody knows about LaFace records. And they yeah. think that was like the beginning. But there was a pre-LaFace hmm. when we were in Los Angeles, like from 83 till we moved to Atlanta in 89. I mean, we were, it was a struggle, man. You know, we were, <laughs> we were knocking on doors and um, I worked at budget rent a car at Santa Monica in Wilshire because I didn't have any money and I wasn't a member of the deal. So they couldn't take care of me. They gave me a place to stay, which was the couch or the floor. Right. Uh, to write songs. 
And I'll never forget, he came to me one day. He said, if you can figure out how to stay out here, I think something's going to happen. Mm-hmm. And I said, well, I'm not going home. So I said, I'll figure it out because he was married at the time. Yeah. And I stayed with him for a little while. And then I had to leave because, you know, he had a wife and, yeah. you know, mm-hmm. she wanted her privacy. I understood. So it was a hardcore survival for me uh, trying to hang on. And so eventually I came back, slept on the floor with the equipment. And I'm trying to think what happened. I think by that time, I don't know if rock steady had happened. I can't remember. Kenny's memory is way better than mine. But I remember <laughs> sleeping in the room on the highland in the apartment. And this whirlwind of everything started happening. Wow. It's like, hey, man, uh, James Ingram's coming by. Another day, hey man, this girl named Paula Abdul is coming by. Hey man, uh, get up. This girl uh, Karen White is coming by. This this guy Johnny Gill, he has a really big grown man voice. He's coming by, mm. and these people were coming by our little tiny apartment, listening to our songs. And Kenny and I would sing them, or Kenny would sing, and I'd do the backgrounds or the co hooks. And it was literally, it just became crazy. And it was just a, it was a writing machine. Right. It just, wow. I didn't want to be a producer. Right. I never wanted to be a producer. I had no choice but to be a producer because Kenny and LA were so busy. Right. They were like, they were like, hey, dude, you got to help <laughs> us do these records. He's like, you know what to do. Yeah. And I'm like, I don't know what to do. So you've been sitting back on the couch and all these sessions, you know, get up here and finish these ad libs with Karen White, Superwoman. Wow. That's my first gig. Wow. And they left and I think went to work with Pebbles. And I walked up to the console. And once again, I said, okay, what would Kenny say? What would Kenny do? I know what he would do. And I would do it, take it back to them. Go, okay, cool. You're good. You're good. Uh, maybe do this. Maybe do that. I'm like, okay. Now I need you to go down to Silver Lake and work on the boys. They're gonna they're gonna do Dial My Heart. I'm like, okay, cool. Right. And so they they would give me the overflow. Of it, it was literally crazy. I mean, at one point, I think we had five. I forget what year we had. Maybe five songs in the top ten R and B. Wow. At one point, and people used to ask us, "How are you guys?" doing all this work. Well, we never stopped working. We worked every day. Right. It was, took two days off, uh, Thanksgiving and Christmas. Wow. And it was literally, and it was the funnest time to me mm. because we had no responsibilities, no kids. We just wrote songs every day. Every yeah. day we just woke <laughs> up. Kenny go, oh, I got, I got this idea. I'm going, okay, let me hear it. And it'd be, you know, whatever, love saw it or knocked out or, wow. you know, he just, I was like, mm-hmm. damn, that's hot. Let's, he said, let's work on that. It's like, okay, let's work on that. You know? And so it was probably, I tell people it was my brokest time, but yeah. it was the funnest time because wow. it was 100% music every day without a care in the world, without a care in the world, just writing, just writing and then recording, you know, going to the studio up late at night, you know, I'd stay home and work on lyrics. Kenny and I would stay home and write. L.A. would go and produce vocals. Uh, i go produce vocals. L.A. and Kenny would go over to wherever to work with Sheena Easton or or uh, Pebbles or whoever else was. You know, when I think about it, it's, it was really a crazy time. It yeah. really, I, don't, I don't really know how we did it. And to think there was no auto-tune. Exactly. <laughs> we yeah. had to make people sing. We had to make yeah. them. So it was work work. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> you know? Uh, it fun. It, it's funny that you talk about your work ethic because Tim and Bob told me this story that uh, an experience that they had with you. Uh, I don't know. I don't even remember. I don't know if you remember this, but there was a time where they had all their music in, on a hard drive. They ended up losing this hard drive and mm-hmm. they came to you and they were crying and they were like, we lost all of our songs. And what you told them was, OK, go make some more. And that's crazy to me. It was like, just got to go back to work. That probably sounds right. <laughs> that, that that probably is something that I said. And right. you know who I got that from, right? <laughs> <laughs> right, baby face. <laughs> exactly. Yeah. You know, it's like, okay. He's like, we'll write something else. Like, okay, let's go. And we right. roll our sleeves up and go back to work. I lost mine, a floppy disk. I had a big anvil road case wow. with floppy disks of songs. Actually, when we first moved to Atlanta, I had this really nice apartment. I think somebody was hating on me. I had this apartment <laughs> on the river. It's a beautiful window and you know, had my plaques up in the window 
and I came from the studio one night and they had taken everything, <laughs> everything. Wow. And I was devastated. And all I wanted was the briefcase because right. it had the floppy disk with the songs. I didn't care about the clothes, the furniture, the whatever it was. Right. And so I had put signs around, I lived in Dunwoody and I was putting signs around, hey, a thousand dollars for the briefcase of these floppy disks. I mean, I was driving around looking in dumpsters because someone did it out of spite. I mean, they took my underwear, they took oh, socks. Oh yeah, they took every, it was like the Grinch stole Christmas. You know how people yeah. walked in? Yeah. I walked in, I was like, damn, I actually had to get a suit to go to an event in Minneapolis. I had to go to a department store and get a suit because they took right. all my suits, wow. everything. But anyway, um, yeah, that I, I came back, I said, well, I'll write some more songs. Wow. And so, you know, I forgot about that. That was crazy. I was yeah. devastated. <laughs> yeah. But yeah, that sounds like something I would have told them. And yeah. they were talented enough. They were, they were really talented guys. Still are really yeah. talented guys. Yeah. And I guess that's type of, that's kind of the thing is it's not only the work ethic, but it's your ability to identify the talent because maybe your approach with someone that you didn't think was capable of writing great songs, maybe you wouldn't have mm -hmm. had that approach, but this kind of goes to just showing how you can evaluate talent and see it. Absolutely. That was something that I thought I could do. Um, and the same way when somebody would br bring songs, when I would say, this just isn't really, it's not strong. Right. You know what I mean? It doesn't have structure or they start this way and all of a sudden they make this terrible left turn. I go, I go, wow, why did you change the second verse rhythm? Right. Oh, oh, I just want to do something different. I go, no, it's, it's, it's commercial. It's got to be the same. It's got it. So when people can sing along, you know, so I could identify that uh, pretty early on, you know, with people that I thought were really talented, like Tim and Bob were really talented, you know, um, and so, yeah, uh, we, we could identify that, you know, people would want to play songs or similar songs, or I used to tell people, <laughs> don't play songs in front of me. If you can't handle the truth, <laughs> you, better, <laughs> you better let me take it with me because I'm not, one thing I will not do. I will not lie about music. Wow. I will not lie about music. And I would tell kids that that's so you want to play it. Okay. Play it at your own risk, but I'm, I'm going to get, you're going to get the truth. I'm not going to sugarcoat it. Cause I, I do music. That's what I do. I, I write songs. I make records. I don't dance. I don't perform. I don't right. do no videos. I don't know nothing about styling. I write songs and I right. make records. <laughs> you know. So, so Daryl, as you're creating all of these hits uh, with Babyface, L.A. Reid, at, at what point does the does the money start coming in? Like, did you have a good grasp on the music industry? at that time or not at all? <laughs> oh, no. no, no. Kenny always, Kenny had a early grip on it because he had co-written a song called Slow Jam for Midnight Star right, with a yep. guy named Bo Watson. Right. So Kenny was getting some checks and he started to understand the royalty and publishing thing, which was great because he was schooling me. Right. And so I'll never forget, I was out in the valley at a friend's house, actually at a girlfriend's house, and Kenny calls me and he says, hey, you got a check. And I go, okay, check for what? In the Mood, because I wrote a song called In the Mood and LA and Kenny wrote Rock Steady and it was on right. the Whispers album, okay. something better with time or something like that. Sure. And so he said, you got to check for 14,000. And I'm like, yeah, get the hell out of here. You're <laughs> right. Because I never had 500 bucks in my pocket at one time. Right. So he goes, no, 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 you got like 14,000 and LA, got, LA and I got like 25 grand. I'm like, what? Hmm. So I'm gonna come get you. No, the girl brought me. I met them in the valley. Yeah. And he goes, yeah, you got it. He said, but this is the thing. He said, this is just the beginning. He said, these are small checks. These are, these are, it's just starting to trickle in. I'm going, what? I'm like, this is like all my portion? He goes, yeah. And I'm like, Kenny, you crazy. You know, mm -hmm. so quickly started to understand, you know, okay, well, if we can get paid pretty good for something that we love to do and we've been doing for free, well, we just rolled up our sleeves and go, okay, well, we're really going to go to work, right? you know, <laughs> but it never was for money. Right. It was because we saw what our, what our work could, what the result would be. Yeah. So it never was money first. It's always song first. Let's write a great song. And then whatever the perks of it, they just fall where they fall, you know? And so that was our approach to it. And, you know, I said, wow, because I had no clue. And a lot of people didn't. You know, my parents didn't know how I made money. Our friends didn't know how I made money because they didn't know, understand 
it wasn't a popular thing back then. You know what I mean? Right. Uh, and I think we had gotten some information from Jimmy and Terry because Clarence Avant was managing them. And so they were kind of ahead and were making good money. And so I think Ellie and Kenny, you know, got a lot of advice and stuff from Clarence Avon, who 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 guided them and then eventually did my first publishing deal for me at Warner Chapel. Wow. So uh, but it was always about the work, though. We didn't we didn't we didn't rest on what we had done. It was like, OK, what's next? Right. What, what we got? Who Who's coming in? OK, what we got to we got to come up with something. Right. You know, so it, it was always about where and, and to all throughout our career. You know, because we never wanted to do anything just for say, oh, we threw it out there just to get a check. It's like, yeah, yeah. no, our name's on it. You know, yeah. want to be proud of it, even if it's not a hit. Hey, we did work hard on it. It didn't work. Okay, what's next? Right. <laughs> yeah, yeah, you know, that was the philosophy. You know. So, Daryl, as, as your career progresses and you guys start creating <clears throat> these massive hits, at what point do you realize? Because obviously these songs were were huge on the R and B charts. Some crossed over to the Billboard mm -hmm. 100. But at what point yeah, you start? Them. At what point do you start realizing that these records records are connecting the dots internationally, worldwide, and all of that? Like, th was that pretty early on for you guys as well? No, I think you don't really realize that stuff. You're just you're just working. Yeah. At that point, you're not studying it in depth. You know what I mean? Somebody may tell you, oh, did you guys know that this happens? Like, oh, wow, really? That's cool. It's like, yeah. I don't know what that means, but if it's good. Okay, Michael Jordan once said, he says, your legacy really happens sort of when you're done. You don't yeah. think about that when you're in the moment of doing it. That's you're true. not thinking of legacy and I'm going to be doing, you know, the last dance. I'm going to, you're just in the moment of it and working your ass off. Yeah. And so at the that comes at the end when people look back and go, well, damn. Kind of just like <laughs> you're saying, yeah. Damn, you did a lot of records. I'm like, damn, I guess we did. But but when you're in the moment, that doesn't, you know, you know, it's just not a thought. We're just working. It's all about just working and keep working. <laughs> you know, <laughs> that's that's really what it, what it was back then. You know, um, I'll hear kids today yeah. say, yeah, you know, when I make it or when I made it, that was a forbidden word with the, <laughs> with us. Right. We never used that word. Never. Because to me, made it meant, oh, I'm at the end. Wow. You made it. Made it where? You're at the end? No. I ain't made it nowhere. I, I, I still, I'm I, still going. I want to keep going and keep trying. But a lot of kids, and it's a younger mentality. I get it. I'm not knocking them. Right. But it just kind of it just kind of irks me when I hear a kid say, yeah, when I made it, you know, first thing I did was like, eh, okay. I get it. Different language, different days. It's social media. It's show off all my stuff. You know, I, I get it. You know, I have a young son and young daughter, so yeah. I get it. Just I'm old, old school, man. Yeah, you know, I'm, I say I'm analog. I love tape. Right. <laughs> <laughs> I'm analog, and I love the hiss of tape. So right. You know, but I get it. Yeah, you know, I mean, cool. I mean, you must have at least felt a little bit of it when End of the Road came out, because that was that was a massive record. Yeah, I was gonna say if there yeah. was a record, yeah, <laughs> that for me, that was like the first time because. I mean, I, I just couldn't believe it. It just wouldn't stop playing. Yeah. It, it was a good thing. <laughs> but actually, people like, I would hear people like, I'm so tired of that damn song. That song on 100 times a day. And I was like, <laughs> you know, and it just wouldn't stop. It just, it just, and then, you know, yeah, we felt that internationally, pop chart, of course. It just was, that was something very, very crazy that, Hey, just took on a life of its own. It it did. Just you know. <laughs> Thank you, boys to men. Yeah, I, and when I when I listen to that song, still like I, I just love what you guys did with Wanye, especially at the end where he's just going off. Like, can you just talk about putting that song together, especially that end part? Because like that that to me is what like '90s R&B or what good R&B mm -hmm. even is about is like. You want to be mm. able to finish off strong and make them feel something. And like, that's what I got from that song. Yeah. That's one of those records that, uh, short story, I don't go too long, but we needed one more song for the soundtrack, which right. was Boomerang. Yeah. People don't realize I never worked with on a Boys to Men album. I worked right. with Boys to Men on Boomerang, but I yeah. never worked with them ever again. That's right. And End of the Road came from Boomerang, not from a Boys to Men album. Right. You know, so it was the last song and Kenny and I went down to where we worked on songs in Buckhead. It was raining, it was cold, needed one more song. And went down there very early 
And uh, Kenny had this little hockey game, you know, the little manual hockey thing with the clear, you know, bubble on it. Yeah. yeah, yeah. And so we, you know, we'd play some hockey and, you know, go back and Kenny would work on some ideas. We'd go back and play. And it was an all day thing. And finally, you know, he kind of he kind of hit on it. I go, man, that's I said, that feels good. He goes, yeah. So what ha what's happened, though? The song is something's happened. Kenny was good at saying, what's it saying? Right. Something something happened. I said, whatever it happened, it was bad. I said, it's, it's bad. It's sad. It was raining that day outside, <laughs> you know, and, you know, eventually, of course, he does what he does and comes up with the melody. And then we started the story and he had gone through a divorce. And I had just gone through a divorce, so it was perfect timing. It's right. what Kenny would call the stars are aligning wow. <laughs> to make it happen. So we just kind of poured that whole, you know, divorce thing. And then, of course, you know, you have to embellish the lyrics to make it what Kenny says universal to make everybody be able to relate it to their story, whether it's a boyfriend, girlfriend, you know, husband, wife. Yeah. Uh, and so, and we knew it. We knew it was good. And L.A. calls it. Y'all got one? Because he was at the office all day. He, he did a lot of business. Yeah. And go, Kenny, we, he goes, we got one. He goes, okay, I'll be about be by there when I leave the office. So he comes in, had his suit on, and sits back on cash. All right, let me hear the shit. You know, so like, <laughs> play the shit. So Kenny hits it. He goes, damn, that's a smash. And we go, yeah, we know. And Kenny goes, mm -hmm. but one thing. He goes, what's that? He goes, I can't give it to him. I want to keep it. Mm. And Elliot's like, what? He goes, yeah, I can't let, I can't let him have it. So it's too big. And Elliot goes, no, no, to be bigger on boys to men, blah, blah, blah. I was somewhere in the middle. Yeah. You know me, I was always the, the middle man. And Kenny says, well, let me record it. Let's record it tonight and see what it feels like. And I said, okay, cool. So we go to the studio and put it on. And I think Kenny sang a verse and the first chords. He took off the headphones and said, okay, they can have it. And I was <laughs> like, yes. Wow. Because I felt like they were, they were just big. They were pop. I just felt like it would be bigger. Yeah, he would make he would have made it a hit, but uh, so uh, we all three went to Philadelphia. It was the last day they had been rehearsing for a world tour, and we get there, and Sean comes in, and goes, "Wanye can't sing," and we're like, hmm. "What do you mean he can't sing? He goes, he has no voice." Be, We've been rehearsing. He's like, "Well, well, we have this is our only day to do it. I mean, we had flown to Philadelphia last song for the soundtrack, and Wanye says, "Well, the only way I can sing it." is if I stand in the back of the room and sing really loud. Mm. And L.A. was like, okay, then stand the fuck back then. Get back there. <laughs> Get your ass back there. And he stood in the corner. So what you're talking about is really the pain of Wanye's throat standing way back in the room. And he's got a towel on his throat. And he's rocking. And he's singing. And I'm feeling so bad for him. I mean, wow. I'm feeling. But at the same time, the shit that he's saying, oh, my God. Help me out a little bit, baby. His voice is cracking. And I'm getting chill bumps. And I'm like, oh, shit, this is phenomenal. Yeah. This performance is killing me. <laughs> and he, I don't know how many times he sang it. He didn't sing it many times because he didn't have a voice. And I tell people, when you listen to the fade, when he says, oh, my God, somebody else, help me out a little bit, baby. He was in so much pain. He's just rocking. You know, let Wanye Ye rock. And that was all Wanye, Ye, just the pain wow. and the passion and man, that thing, when it was done, I was like, wow. Didn't know it was that big. We never know yeah. when how big something's gonna be. But I knew it was really good and I knew it was big from that emotional because like you said, you can hear it today and you you can get a little misty eyed if yeah. you get into it. Because he that performance was so incredible to me and their backgrounds and those dudes are those dudes are incredible, man. Those dudes are truly amazing. Sean's voice and Nate, how they layer stuff and how they know who's gonna come in. Yeah. And you know Wanye is gonna knock it out the park and take it home. Yeah. But they're set up with Nate and then, you know, Sean and then Wanye. It's like, man, it was that that was really a fun, fun, fun record and just an incredible time, you know. Yeah. One of those one of those kind of records, you know. Was uh was Mike's speaking part part of the the concept that you guys had originally, or did that come afterwards? I think yeah, I think Kenny said you know we knew what Mike did, and yeah. so I think Kenny wrote that in there for him to, uh, you know, so everybody could be a part of it. Absolutely, yeah. I I really believe that. Yeah. You know, 
And I remember the guys teasing him for what he was saying. Right. You know, it was kind of funny. You know, man, you sent what some word they were saying, man, you sent and you big and this stuff. But it was funny, yeah. you know, but he killed it. He he killed it. It was everybody's part, you know, made that happen, you know. And uh, it's a good record. When I hear it today, I go, man, that's just, that's a really good, a really good record. You yeah. Know, really proud of that record. Absolutely. I got a couple more records for for you here, Daryl. I mean, we could go on okay. forever here, but uh, I'm just going to touch on these ones. But like the Mariah Carey okay. record you guys did, Never Forget You. I just love the arrangements on that song. Like that song just feels good. Uh, I was just kind of, you know, I remember it. I remember going to the session with Mariah. Yeah. And I don't know. I kind of don't feel like I had too, too much input. Okay. You know, it was lyrical, of yeah. course, with Kenny, and I loved the song. Yeah. And what, what I remember, I hate to say this, but when we went there, you know, she works by herself. We couldn't go in the room. Exactly. It was her and Walter Athanasio. Yeah. And so that was strange for me. I'm like, we can't go in? Mm -hmm. Kenny goes, no, she does her vocals by herself. And I'm like, damn, okay. She'd come out, and then we go in and, and hear it. And, you know, she did an incredible job. She knows what she's doing. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> the girl knows how to sing. So that one was a little, I don't know. You know, good record though. I, I really yes. like, I really like that record. That was a, that was a good record. Right. Uh, really good record. Um, of course, you worked on the TLC debut album as well as Tony Braxton's debut album, uh, and I want to mm -hmm. touch on Tony's because, I mean, it's it's super cool to look back at that album and know mm -hmm. that some of those records were originally for somebody else, but it ended up yeah. on Tony. <laughs> and like yeah. when you listen to it now, it's like. It couldn't be anyone else but Tony. Like, it no, like those not songs at all. Were for Tony, but just talk about those moments. Yeah, you're exactly right. It couldn't. It. I always believe in fate. I believe things happen the way they're supposed to happen. Yeah. And that's how that happened. I mean, we were trying to crank out these songs for Anita Baker because Kenny wanted to do a duet with her. We wanted her on the album because we wanted big, big names on the album. You know, and so we would work on a song. And call Anita, we send it and call, have her on speakerphone. And, you know, she say she didn't like the beat on this one. And then the other one, you know, it was just like, we were like, damn, what is she, what is she looking for? Right. You know, it's very frustrating because we're working really hard. And Tony was singing the demos. I'd be in, back in the back with her working on the demos. It's okay, sing it like this. Sing it like how Anita was singing. Because we're trying to sell this song to yeah. Anita Baker. Right. And so I don't know what song it was. I don't know if it was Give You My Heart or You Mean the World to Me or something, but right. I remember her being on speakerphone and she said at the end, she didn't like the song. I mm -hmm. forget which one it was. And she says, well, what about the little girl singing on the demo? Why don't y'all let her sing? Mm. And we looked, we were standing around the speakerphone and LA said, okay. Boom. <laughs> said, Tony, you got four songs for your album. And she was so excited. I remember wow. she was so excited. And I don't know, another sad love song, Give You My Heart, Mean the World to Me. I can't remember what four, right. but they were four great songs, right. you know? And so that was the start of, of Tony's album, uh, those four songs that Anita had turned down. And uh, and it happened the way it was supposed to happen. You're exactly right. Great album, it was fun work. It's always still fun working. So she's like a sister. Right. We have fun, we cut up, we laugh. She's very funny, she works hard. She listens. Um, and when that album was done, I think me and L.A. rode around the subdivision. She goes, what do you think she's going to sell? I said, 1.2. Wow. He goes, nah, 2 million. I go, really? I was like, eh, maybe 1.5, but my number is 1.2. Yeah. And I don't know how many she sold. I have a plaque for 9 million. I yeah. think. <laughs> but I don't know what the ending was, but right. just it, that's a great album. Great. Just Tony is is my favorite female voice to record yeah. to hear her voice back oh yeah in the speaker that's my favorite voice um, oh yeah to record um one of my favorite tony songs is on her album snowflakes mm. that we did together called uh christmas time is here and okay. what's the other one kenny and i wrote i can't it's two songs right and but christmas time is here is actually one of my favorite uh tony braxton performances Wow. Uh, yeah, yeah. Tony's great. Still sounds great. <laughs> no, for sure. Yeah. And, yeah. and what I love about that album, Daryl, is from top to bottom, it's super cohesive. Um, of course, you guys worked on the whole project 
uh, mm -hmm. the majority of it. I'm curious, when you're writing for artists back then or even today, how much are you paying attention to what the artist is doing with other producers? Or is it just a, a clean canvas when they get in the studio with you? Uh, not back then. It was like, we do what we do. Right. You know, we stick to what we do. We listen to what Jimmy and Terry did and what Teddy did. And, yeah. You know, the other producers at that time. But that's what they did. You know, Teddy was New Jack, hard ass beat. Yeah. So we didn't we didn't try to do that. And, you know, Jimmy and Terry were, you know, very uh, musical, pristine. Yeah. Um, and we admired what they did, but we didn't try to emulate. We just said, oh, we got to write something as strong as that. Oh, they got this. OK, we got to go to work. We got to we got to come up with something else. But we didn't try to copy what anybody did we stuck to our guns of what we felt worked for us just like they did right you know and it was it was a friendly camaraderie so we just stuck to our guns and we always felt like if it's a hit record you, you can't keep it down right you know <laughs> if, if it's a hit it doesn't matter what you, you, you're not going to keep it down you know so that was kind of our our philosophy of you know later we change we try to change with technology and you know, new sounds and different drum things. But uh, but yeah, for the most part, we just stuck to what the formula was. It worked. Great yeah. melody, great lyric, great story. Okay. Get a great performance out of the singer. Right. Okay. You know, let's, let's, let's try to keep doing it. You know, yeah. absolutely. And I'm trying to get my timeline here uh, right. And this is something Tim and Bob shared with me because they started working with Destiny's Child after, I guess, their situation with you didn't pan out. Um, mm -hmm. Can you just talk about that Destiny's Child um, era for you? Because that was early on. Uh, really quick. I don't yeah. want to tell a lot because I'm gonna. I am gonna do a book, and I want to tell the. I want to devote a whole chapter to okay. Destiny's Child. But anyway, I mean, I had some relatives that in Texas that worked in an apartment complex, and they had these little girls. In some kind of way, Matthew or them found out they were related to me. Hey, can you send them a demo? And so eventually they sent me a demo videotape. Matthew was big on VHS and showing me the girls rehearsing, dancing, singing lessons. I mean, he was he was grooming these kids. Yeah. And I'm like, damn, these kids are working this hard. <laughs> so I said, I, I got to go see this. Yeah. So I went to Texas, got on a plane, went to Houston and they met me at the hotel. I brought my video camera and I videotaped them, you know, wow. singing live, acapella. Beyonce sang the Jackson, Jackson 5 song. I want to be where you are. Oh, anyway, and she's killing it. Yeah. She actually uses it in her documentary. Wow. The documentary that she did, I, I uh, gave her the uh, the video. I had a lot of old video and she called when she okay. was pregnant with Blue Ivy and I flew to me, she flew me to New York and I had a box of tapes and, you know, pictures and whatever right. they had had gotten burned up, but not to sidetrack. So I signed them, brought them to Atlanta and I was, you know, I was busy. I was yeah. starting to work by myself. I was still working with Ellie and Kenny a little bit because they were kind of starting to go separate ways. But I was more, I had bought a building, started my own company called Silent Partner Productions. Yep. And I signed the girls. I had a rapper and I had a solo, a solo artist named Tan who still works with me today. Mm. Does a lot of backgrounds. Yep. She's incredible. She was a solo artist back then. And so I was so busy. I think Tim and Bob were the first producers that worked with them. Yeah. They went in the studio and brought it back to me and I would critique it just like Kenny did me. Yep. And uh, I actually found the cassette of it uh, a couple of years ago when I moved Right. of, wow. of the song that they did with, with uh, and they were called the Dolls. I named them the Dolls back right. then. <laughs> and they became Destiny's Child when they left me and went to Columbia. Right. But yeah, Tim and Bob were the first ones to work with them. And then I, did, I had never even worked with them because right. I was so busy. I signed them, said, okay, you're going to work with Tim and Bob, then you're going to work with you know, Aaron Pettigrew and his team, and you're going to work with, because I had some pro producers and writers underneath me, you know, and I think at the time I was doing Why I Love You So Much with Monica. Mm, yeah. Because Dallas lives next door. He goes, hey, you got a song for Monica? I go, uh, I will. <laughs> and I, think I, I crapped at Why I Love You So Much in about an hour. I already had these little kind of yeah. catchy chords. Yeah. And uh, I crafted the song really fast. I really wanted to work for Dallas. Yep. And I went next door, recorded it with Monica. So I was too busy at the time to, right. to, I was going to work with them, but it didn't work out in the end. Me and Matthew didn't see eye to eye and eventually it did what it did. But I eventually came back 
on writings on the on the wall and did a song called Stay that I wrote for them. Right. And yep. when, they, when they got signed to Columbia as Destiny's Child. So I think, yes, yeah, back here. Yep, exactly. Yeah, exactly. Yep. Yep. So that was kind of cool. Came full circle. And it's just, you know, when I met with her, I said, you know, B, I said, if I was just a stepping stone in what you guys were doing and what you eventually did, I said, I'll take that. Yeah. I said, she said, yeah, you were. She said, I learned a lot from you. I remember the meetings that you used to have, you know, telling us this, do this, don't do that. And she's so gracious for whatever it was I did. Yeah. And I don't feel like I did much. I brought him from Houston. Everybody in Atlanta knew about him. Usher was around hanging out with him. Monica was hanging out with him. Wow. You know, because they were here for a long time. They were rehearsing in my basement. And so they were taking school in my office, a tutor. I, I was paying a tutor. You know, uh, they were rehearsing. So they were doing the old school way, the old yeah. school grooming and Renee, my assistant, was doing styling and clothing, trying to come up with a look. And, you know, eventually I did get them a record deal with Electra. Sylvia Rome flew down and yeah. she loved them. And but it was just, you know, me and Matthew both had egos. Yeah. You know, sure. he had an ego because it was his group. I had an ego because I was who I thought I was during the time. I was the producer. It was my company. Yeah. And, you know, me and Matthew end up talking later, realizing that we should have worked together. Yeah. You know, and I was a young businessman and I did not handle that in the best way. But I always say and people go, oh, don't you feel bad that, you know, they got away and they became this? I go, no. I said, because I'm a believer that things happen the way they're supposed to happen. Right. And and I've had a great career. Yeah. You know, I so I, I never was bitter. I was happy for them. They're they're like daughters to me. Yeah. You know, and I and I was really happy because I knew they were talented. Like you said, I identified that girl, when I went to Houston, I said, that kid's a star. Yeah. And she can sing. She knows how to sing. I didn't have to tell her how to sing. Right. She knew how to sing. To this day, it's it, it's not much different when she was a kid. It's just stronger, louder. It's just a little bit better. Yeah. But she possessed that quality when she was 13 years old. And I saw that. And I said, this kid's a star. This kid is. And, you know, it was just, it was just bad. It, I won't say bad business moves on my part, but at the end of the day, when I stepped back and looked at it, I should have signed them to LaFace and I didn't. Mm -hmm. And I didn't sign them to LaFace because I felt like with TLC and all the other things we had, yeah. I didn't know if they would get the attention that I wanted to get. Right. And so I said, well, maybe I should take them outside of LaFace since I have my own company. Yeah. And, you know, and that was my thought. But at the end of the day, I should have signed them to the face, but who knows what would have happened? Exactly. You know, yeah. it's, 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 the, it's, it's that fate. And I think kids ending up where they should end up. And so if I was just a stepping stone, okay, uh, I'll, I'll take that. You know, I'm, I'm, I'm happy for her. Even when I met with her up at a uh, park, what's, what's her company called? Uh, is it Ivy park? Yeah. Her, forget yeah. The, yeah. yeah. She had just moved in. And she goes, you know, I'm not working with my dad. And I said, yeah, I know. I said, but Jay's a good guy. He's really, she said, oh, Daryl, he's so smart. I said, that's good. You'll be okay <laughs> then. She yeah. was a little nervous. She said, he's a really smart guy. And I've I met him before. He's a really great guy. Yeah. And so we sat there for four hours, man. We went through pictures, video. People were coming out of her office. They were in, because they had never seen her little. I had all these right. videos when, when she was young. Yeah. And so I, we sat there for four hours, man. And just, uh, she thanked me. And I thanked her and I told her, I'm so proud of you. And I told her, I said, I didn't think this was going to happen. Yeah. <laughs> you know, because she used to say, she said, yeah, I remember you used to say, be careful what you wish for, you know, because when you become celebrity, you give up a lot of your life. She said, oh, Daryl, I wish I could go to the mall. She said, yeah. I wish I could just take my nieces right. and nephews to the beach. I said, well, I said, that's that's what happens. Right. <laughs> so I, I, and I'm very proud. I am very proud to know that I had maybe whatever you want to call it. Uh, and, you know, I know her. She knows me. I think Kenny saw her not long ago. He said, yeah, I saw Beyonce. She goes, how's Daryl doing? He goes, oh, he's cool. He goes, I love Daryl. <laughs> <laughs> and so I love Beyonce. She's really the same person, man. Just a great personality. Just that Houston kind of little country yeah. uh, that she has. His to me has always remained the same, you know? And like I said, she was a star. Like I said, she was, I didn't know she was going to be the biggest star in the world, but right. man, 
I identified that this kid is a star at 13, 14 years old. You know, great story. But I got there's a lot of details that I'll that I'll get into um, in the book. There's some yeah. great stories too. Great stories. Yeah, yeah I can't wait for it because let me tell you, Daryl. So uh, Tim actually sent me a record that uh, they did with Beyonce. I guess when she was 13 or 14. And I, I have mm -hmm. to send it to you afterwards. I think it's called uh, My Life, I think it's called. I, okay. I guess, yeah, so it, okay, it was cool. during that era. So she was 13 or 14. Mm. Just early on, you okay. could already identify her vocals, mm -hmm. the way she was doing Absolutely. runs. Like, that That was just She natural. did that. Yeah. It was natural. Yeah, it, it, yeah, it was natural. I tell people, it was, you know, you could say, hey, do this again or, you know, put this here. But for the most part, she knew how to sing. You know, she knew how to sing. And like I said, I, that's what I identified. I'm a, I'm a record man. I'm a, I'm yes. a, I'm a singer's producer. Yeah. So I'm listening for any little thing, you know, right. and she, and she had it at a very, at a very young age, just like Usher. They're the same age. Yeah. You know, Usher was hanging around. I was like, this little kid, he's, this kid going to be a star. He's, right. He sings like this now at 13, 14. Yeah. He's just going to get better. Yeah. And he did. He did. And, you know, they came from the same era of that hard work, no auto tune, Right. keep grinding just because you had a hit you don't stop they were they grew up with that you know up under us they saw us constantly never quitting you know here's another here's another hit here's another hit and so they carried that into their adult careers and that's why they're still thriving because it's it's their work ethic they they know what it takes you know they they yeah. know what it takes you know yeah, yeah. great artists both of them great i just saw us in las vegas yeah, yeah, I great. saw a picture of that. That was that was pretty yeah, cool. Yeah, great, phenomenal. Just yeah. sat there like I was like, damn, students. <laughs> like, <laughs> you know, when you see somebody start at 13 or like when Tony first got to Atlanta, then you see what they blossom into. It's like, damn. Yeah. It's like, wow. <laughs> you, know, it's, you know, you feel proud. You know, you really feel proud that they kept working and working hard because that's what it's about. Yeah. It's, it's about working hard and staying on your grind and that's that's what it's about, man. To be to be great, you know. That's what it takes, you know. Yeah, yeah. Great artist, for sure. Daryl, I want to touch on this here because we had posted this a couple of weeks ago. You reshared it. Uh, it's the Destiny's Child record. Stay. Um, I know Pink's mm -hmm. group at one point recorded that record as well. Can you kind of mm -hmm. give me the the history of that? You know, when I when that was posted, I yeah. actually I wasn't being funny because somebody said, "Did you know that?" You know, mm. <laughs> Pink or or Troy, the group of Troy's recorded at first. I'm going, I didn't remember that. Right. I'm like, I wasn't trying to be funny. Right. I go, wow, I didn't know that. But actually, they did. And and then I had to sit and think. I go, yeah, I think we worked on the demo at my house in my home studio. I think I was the first one to work with Choice, the three right. girls, uh, Alicia Moore, Pink, and then yeah. two other girls. And but it just, I, you know, there's so much music and so many things that we've done. Right. I I I, I just couldn't recall it. Yeah. You know what I mean? And so I guess when Pink decided to be a solo artist or L.A. decided she was going to be a solo artist, then, yeah. you know, that whole project was scrapped. So then when I got the call to work with Destiny's Child, I go, oh, I have a song, <laughs> you know, and, and it was the, it was the perfect song. But even then, when I did it, I was glad that I didn't know that they had recorded because I went into it like nobody had recorded it. Wow. You yeah. know, so I didn't I didn't draw anything from the other version. Yeah. So I only right. know Destiny's Child's version. Wow. That's what I know. I don't I don't know know the other version. Wow. So uh so that's how that came about. I had a song, they came in and Beyonce was great and killed it. And it's a great song. It's it's you know, it wasn't a hit, you know, song on an album. Yeah. But I, I really like the song. And every song that you know you like, everything that you do is not gonna be a hit. No, of course you not. Know? Yeah. Uh there are a lot of songs that I, I really love that aren't that aren't hits, you know. Um, so um, so yeah, they did a great job. So it was it was a fitting way for me to still get to work with them. Yeah. And uh, so that was kind of cool for me, you know, really cool. I enjoyed it. You know? Yeah. I'm just trying to imagine what other records in your discography that may have went to one artist and then another, but I, I doubt there are many. Mm, that never happened yeah. for me. Yeah. Exactly. And like I said, I don't even remember that. But right. that never happened. <laughs> That never happened for me. People turn down songs. Yeah. Like, okay. You know. You know. Kenny knows that history really well. Right. Uh, I don't. I forget who it was. He said we played. I don't know what played some one of Bobby's records for somebody. Mm. They didn't. They passed on it. Okay. Uh, uh, 
But just like he wrote, every time I close my eyes for Luther, Luther didn't like it. Oh, wow. And so Kenny recorded it and won a Grammy with it. Yeah, that was you know, a big Beautiful hit. song. One of my favorite songs. Yeah, oh, I yeah. love that record. Oh, yeah. yeah. So it's just, you know, sometimes artists just don't think it's for them or they don't hear it. Yeah. You know, they go, oh, I don't hear it. Like, okay, you, you need to hear it. Right. <laughs> <laughs> so, yeah, it, it happened. It has happened. And not only for us, other producers, I'm sure, have those oh, stories yeah. as well. Of yeah. course. So a lot of music, man. Yeah. So, Daryl, let's talk about Silent Partner. That's when you kind of branched off. I know Ellie Reed and Babyface were kind of going their separate ways. You started your own production company. I think musically at that point, you're probably polished. You're seasoned. You had written a bunch of hits at that point. Confidence level. Yeah. Going, confidence level going on your own. What was that at? Nah, it wasn't, it wasn't high. <laughs> you got to remember, I've had a writing partner since I was 15 years old. Right. And now I'm, I'm trying to think what year that was when they kind of you know, went separate, but I was much older. So I was yeah. used to having a songwriting partner. Right. So I really questioned, I mean, when I left LaFace, I said, well, it's either sink or swim and I'm not going to sink. Yeah. So I bought a building, didn't know what the hell I was going to do with it, put some equipment in it, went there every day and just started writing songs. And, you know, I was very nervous. I was really terrified. I really didn't know on my own from writing it, producing it, arranging it, you know, working with the artists, right. setting up the sessions. I mean, you know, LA had done all that and Kitty had done all that. I sat back on the couch, you know. <laughs> so here I am now in the in the in the driver's seat. Yeah. And so, you know, I, I used my same philosophy. I said, okay, I know what's a good record. I know what's a hit. And what would Kenny say? Right. What would Kenny say? And so I worked my ass off. I'd get up in the mornings and go down to my little building at 10 o'clock and I'd work until my kids got out of school and I'd go home and meet them and then I'd go back downstairs in my home studio and work all night. So I worked and I knew that I had to work. Yeah. But now I really had to work. So I had the work ethic and you know, uh so I had done Monica and Monica yeah. did really well. That gave me a lot of confidence because yeah. that was the that was I think the first song I wrote 100 percent Wow and produced it and everything. I think it was a gold, we have a gold single or platinum single over there somewhere. Yep. So that really boosted my confidence. I say, okay, okay, I'm good. Okay, let me, and I never would take it to them. Right. I never would take anything to them. I said, I gotta do it on my own. I gotta see it through. And from there, I think I worked with Lisa Fisher. Mm. I worked with SWD, one of my favorite songs uh, yeah. called You Are My Love. Not a hit, yeah. but just one of my favorite songs. And <clears throat> Who else did I work with? Drew Hill. Worked with a few people. Worked with Drew Hill. That was yeah. probably that was great. my yeah. That was probably my okay. Yeah. He's he's good because I got a phone call. Yeah. From the both of them, from Kenny and L.A. Yeah. Different phone calls. So L.A. calls. Hey, you did that Drew Hill shit? I go, <laughs> yeah. That shit's out of here, man. That shit's out of here. You did a good job. Proud mm. of you, money. And I said, <laughs> okay, cool. Really just made me feel, you know, to get their approval. It's like, yeah, wow, that was everything. So then I get a call from Kenny. Hey. Say, hey, man, what's up? So what you doing? Well, nothing. Yeah, I want to see if you could uh come out here and work on the Soul Food soundtrack and uh, do the backgrounds like you did on your Drew Hill stuff. I was like, okay, mm. sure. That's Kenny's way of complimenting me. Wow. <laughs> so I went out, worked on, we're not making love no more. We don't even, which was, you know, all Kenny. I just did the backgrounds like I did them on my records. And yeah. that was, that was fun. It was great. That was a great record. Kenny had done a great job on the soundtrack. So, so at that point, yeah, I felt I was good. And I went to work with Aretha with Kenny. Yeah. And then we did willing to forgive with Aretha, Kenny and I, that was my first time. And then I got a call back. Yeah. Clyde Davis called me. Wow. Daryl, Aretha loves you. She loves your song called In the Morning because I had submitted a song. She wants to work with you. She likes working with you. I'm going, Aretha Franklin wants to work with me? Like, without Kenny? Wow. Oh, I was talking about terrified. I was so, <laughs> you know, flew to Detroit. I said, I like your song, Daryl. I like the song a whole lot. I'm like, okay, Aretha, Miss Aretha, thank you. <laughs> and I'm sitting there going, what am I going to tell Aretha Franklin to do? This is the greatest female singer That's right. ever. Yeah. What am I going to tell her to do? And if I tell her, is she going to do it? 
<clears throat> so she's probably the the only artist that intimidated me. Wow. You know, that really I was really intimidated. But once we got going and, you know, I started to, you know, see what she was doing and, and felt it out. Yeah. Uh it was uh, you know, it was cool and ended up very cool. Very, very cool. I want to touch. I on just that. realized my light's not on. I just realized my light's not on. Is the lighting okay? Ah, you're you're good. You're good. Okay, yeah, I can yeah, turn the ring light on. Okay, no, cool. You're good. Uh, I want to go back to that Drew Hill stuff that you did because mm -hmm. it was super cool. Because on some records, Cisco was doing leads, but then you also mm -hmm. made sure Jazz was doing leads. Was that like a conscious yeah, thing for you? Absolutely. I identify yeah. I, usually when there's a group, I identify. Okay, who's the lead singer, and then yeah. who's that secondary dude that can sing a part. And you know where that came from? That came from the Jackson Five. Right. Where Michael was the singer. Yeah. But when Jermaine came in, oh, yeah. Just that other voice, great voice, sounds great, but just comes in on that right part. Yeah. You know, and then of course, Cisco's the killer and they can ride it home. So yeah. I identified that right away. And so, and Cisco was just, that dude just incredible. Yeah. Oh, it just sings his ass off, just so much. Yeah. <laughs> you know, I love, I love singers like that. And jazz was the smooth, yeah, finesse, lover man, you know what I mean? Uh, in some ways, a little bit of Kevon and Melvin, yeah, after seven, because yeah. I love the, I love that Melvin is one of the greatest voices too, yeah, ever. I love, I love working with. So I kind of identified that. Uh, and uh, so yeah, it was, it was very easy because they sang so well. And they just bit into the songs and made them theirs, you know, a la Boys to Men, a la After Seven. You know, they, they knew how to sing. Cisco's great with ad libs and singing the band. Didn't have to tell him too much yep. to do. Uh, and a lot of fun because they were raw. You know, they were really raw and full of energy. Cisco, that, oh, that dude was just, he's crazy. He, right. <laughs> he's always incredible. <laughs> right. And that was a lot of fun. So that, that did, from that, I got a call from Stevie J. I got a call from, P. Diddy. Wow. I got a few calls of them wanting me to work on something they had. It didn't pan out, but I did right. get a few calls from people, you know, uh, you know, Kenny called me, <laughs> <laughs> you know, and asked me to come out and do the backgrounds with him on Soul Food. So I got, that was kind of like my, oh, okay, I think he's, maybe he's legit. <laughs> yeah. <right. laughs> you know? Yeah. So that was, that was really, really good. And they did well. The album did well. And um, so, yeah, that was, a, that was a big one for me. You yeah. Know, very cool. Couple more album cuts that you worked on. You did the Escape record. That was yeah. Fun. Did Escape. Yeah, yeah, that was fun. They're great girls. They're like, yeah. You know, everybody in Atlanta. We're like family. You know, yeah. Jermaine calls. Yeah, Jermaine, whatever you want. I got right. you. Right. You know, I love those girls. Candy is great. You know, Tasha, Can Tiny. They're all. They were fun. You know, so all the whole Atlanta family people that I work with, Monica, TLC, Escape. You know, it was just uh, always just fun. It was like we were family. Right down the street, somebody's around the corner. Okay. <laughs> right. You know, so Dallas was next door at dark, you know. Yeah. So exactly. um, those were fun times because we all just helped each other. We had no animosity, right. you know. Uh we all supported each other. And uh it was just that was a really cool time. And it and it sent me to that place where I, I, I did become comfortable, confident, not overconfident or cocky, but just I felt like I really knew what I was doing. You know. Yeah. So it, it was a cool time. Yeah. Um, and in the Tamiya record, who do you tell? That is a that is an amazing record. That was a great song. Yeah, was I was so song. disappointed because Clive told me, uh, "Loving You Still" was yeah. the record. Yeah, good record. Yeah. Oh, I love. I had this guy named Sonny Latterstead who played, as you can hear, the Spanish guitar. Yeah. And I thought that was just such a great record. And I remember, was she on? She was on Quest. Yeah. Yeah. Okay, I'm getting her confused with Deborah Cox. Uh, but to me, uh, I thought for sure it would be a single because I yeah. thought that was a really good record. That was a great you know, song. It sounds good. Uh, she just sang the hell out of it. And it's, that's one of my favorite songs that wasn't a hit. Right. And that and Deborah Cox, I did a song called You're a Natural Woman that Clyde yes. told me was going to be a single right. that wasn't. Oh, and I understand. Man. Yeah. <laughs> oh, I was so disappointed. Because Deborah right. sang the you know what out of that song. Oh, that yeah. girl, whoo, that girl can sing her you know what off, man. That girl, wow. Right. And so that I was really disappointed because Clive told me it was going to be a single. Wow. And you know I knew if he got behind it, it was going to be a hit. You know, and it was yeah. a good record. 
Right. And I forget what else came, but he, he changed his mind on something. Yeah. And, uh, but yeah, both incredible singers. I enjoyed those songs that were, most people don't even know, right. you know, but I thought were really good records, you know, yeah. and, you know, worked really hard on them. Yeah. Worked really hard, like everything, you know, yeah. so that's the way it goes. Yeah. Way it goes sometimes. So yeah. Daryl, as we transition out of the nineties into the two thousands, of course, that's when music starts to change. Um, you know, it starts to transition. You have Timbaland coming in with his production. You mm -hmm. have the Neptunes yeah, coming in. Amazing yeah, sounds. All great but, producers. But a little yeah. different, I guess, than what we were accustomed to in the 90s. Like, how did you kind of transition and adjust during that period? Or did you feel like you had uh, to? I felt like I had to, but I felt like I couldn't. Because I always felt like I'm going to start trying to sound like right. them yeah. or not what it is that I do. So I just kind of rested on what I knew um, and the phone calls that I was getting were still the R&B calls, yeah. from, you know, the R&B artists were whether for after seven or Kenny Lattimore or Jesse Powell or, yes, you know, so I just kind of went, just kind of stayed in my lane. Right. You know, and then eventually, you know, you realize, Hey, you know what I'm doing ain't really the shit anymore. <laughs> so kind of, kind of start fading. I'm still writing with Kenny, which was good because yes. we did. I don't know when Grown and Sexy was, yeah, but we did that. Yeah, I was right. Gonna talk that about was great. That one. Yeah, yeah, that was a great album. And then from there, we did. Uh, you know, we just kind of did what we did. You know, we yeah. did Love, Marriage, and Divorce. Then we did, of course, Return of the Tender Lover. I worked on some other things with him. He was working with Colby Calais, yeah. and I was doing some writing with them. I didn't get anything placed, so I just kind of, just kind of, whatever came my way. I didn't really worry about chasing and trying to change the sound. I just didn't, it's not something that I felt like I wanted to do, you know? Um, and as my career went on, I was like, well, I'm kind of okay. I've had a great career. I'm like an athlete. Yeah. You know, I've had those great years and I maximized it and I'm not going to get caught up into the new guy. Right. You know? <laughs> and so I just kind of worked until my phone stopped ringing. Yeah. I said, Oh, I guess I'm supposed to retire. <laughs> <laughs> so, you know, Eventually, last year when I did the Christmas album, I said, okay, this is it. Turn 65, I'm going to do a Christmas album and ride off into the sunset. Wow. So that's pretty much it. Because <laughs> <laughs> you know. let me tell you, Daryl, even if the songs, and you mentioned this earlier, even though the songs might not be hits, like there are some amazing songs uh, that you guys have done. Like I was just listening to that Grown and Sexy album earlier today, the record story for the good album. things. Like that good that, record. That's a good record. Yeah, like just the writing on that. Like you can still yeah, play that. We wrote, yeah, we wrote. Yeah, that's a great one. Mm -hmm. Yeah, we wrote hard on that stuff. Grown is sexy. Return of the tender lover and yeah. love, marriage and divorce. We yeah. worked our asses off. I mean, I'm saying we. What Kenny said, we're just going to write yeah. how we used to write, and I said okay, and it was fun, and we wrote and worked on it hard. Tony worked on it with us, and I just thought. All three of those albums were a great body of work that just were not successful. And I just I didn't understand why, <laughs> you know, it's like, you just, you just never know, man. You yeah. never know. Yeah. But so much fun. Roller Coaster is one of my favorites. Oh yeah. God. Yeah. yeah. What a I, great, I, great song. I just, was going to talk about that one because that whole love marriage oh, and divorce album, it's like, yeah. And, and not to sound like, like that song, that album ended up, being way better not that not than what i expected but it was just during that time in r&b mm -hmm. there's a lot of stuff that i'm not liking just because it's changed so much but then when that album yeah. came out it was like it was like a reset button for me kind of reminded me why i loved r&b in the first place so mm -hmm. just yeah. talk about it, creating that one because that's one that i think people may have missed out on i mean it was nominated for a grammy but i think we still need to it talk won a about grammy for best oh, r&b that's right it did win it yeah but yeah and i, I was they, like i was like how did that happen Right. <laughs> I was like, what the hell? We yeah. weren't even there. Yeah. It was like, but it was just, I mean, it was just one of those creative times. And Tony worked on it every step of the way with us. And she was writing yeah. really good. And we were just into a groove. The sessions were so much fun. I ran across a video of one of the sessions where we were just cutting up and dancing. And I felt so good because everybody was saying, Babyface and Tony Braxton should be a, do an album together. Yeah. <laughs> for years so here we are finally going to give the world what they want and 
like an anchor. It just sank like an anchor, except in South Africa. Mm. I have a plaque here Wow. for South Africa. We get to South Africa, and Tony comes out. Kenny come out, and they're singing. I forget what the first single was. It wasn't Roller Coasters. I forget the other one. No. And these was. people, you would you would have thought we were in 1992. Wow. These people right. were pressed against the gate. They were singing. What was that single? I can't think of the single. Yeah, let me uh, let me search this up. Really Not quick. Roller Coaster. Yeah. No, it wasn't uh, Roller Coaster. It was Hurt You. I think no. it was. Hurt You. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And these people sang every lyric to the top of their lungs. Wow. And I'm sitting in the pit. They're on stage, and I'm and I'm looking around like, what the hell? Because <laughs> this is an album that's failed in the U. I'm saying nobody even heard it. I didn't ever hear anything on the radio. Yeah. And so I go backstage after the show. Kenny goes, "Can you believe that?" I yeah. said, "Kenny, that's crazy." He said, "You have to record this tomorrow night because nobody would believe it." <laughs> and so I forget how many nights they were there. Yeah. And, uh, and so the next night I'm down. I'm videoing it, and these people. You'd have thought this album was ten times platinum. Wow! And they are singing it. So one of the nights, somebody called Susan Markheim, his management, said, "Hey, they're going to give you guys plaques for." I said, "Plaques for what?" <laughs> <laughs> and so, said, well, evidently in South Africa, it's like platinum, double platinum. And so I actually have a plaque over there wow. in South Africa. Yeah, but I love that album. I thought it was just it's just one of those things where you know Kenny and Tony finally together. Great songs, great performances, and nothing. Wow. You know, nothing. Just so disappointed. I was so disappointed. I tell people, I go, really? They did? When? <laughs> <laughs> like, damn. Yeah. And then, like I said, yeah. that After 7 project, like that that was another one that was kind of a shocker for me because when you look back at it, they had like six singles on Urban AC yeah. radio and they were all hits. Like that was, they were of. hits. And that yeah. was, that was a, a shot the other direction. Yeah. <laughs> because they were out doing uh return of the tender lover that we thought was going to kill. That's right. And here we are, that's failing. And timeless is like, and they had hit up and Kenny turned to me one day and said, go, you know, he said, if this was the nineties, he said, this shit would be like triple platinum. I said, I know. Yeah. <laughs> Cause there are some great songs on there. I want you is one of my is my favorite oh, yeah. song. If, yeah. if I, Kevon sings the doo doo out of that. If I, yeah. Oh, just the, just great songs. You know, it was the old after seven, just kind of, you know, chemistry, and we had fun, and the songs were great. Yeah. And I was like, wow. <laughs> it's the thing about music, man. You 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 when music goes, you have no control. It takes a life of its own. You can right. predict but you don't really know. You can feel good about it, but you don't know. Right. You know, it's up to the world to tell you, you know. For sure. So all we, all we do is feel good. So, okay, I feel good about it. Okay, cool. Let's go. Let's let yeah. it go. <laughs> you know, great album. Fun album. Really. Yeah. Really good songs. And I have to touch yeah. on the record that you did for Kenny Lattimore. I think it was last year. That was a great song, too. Yeah, that was fun. Yeah. I like working with Kenny. Yeah. He, he, I, that's probably maybe the second or third time I've worked with him. Yeah. And he's one of those artists that I like working with him because he's such a professional. Yeah, exactly. And there's no nonsense. Not that other people aren't, but he just, he's always prepared. It's oh. about business. He sings great. And I, it's just one of those artists that I like working with. Right. You know, and we never had a hit, but I like the, I like the work that we did together. Yeah. You know, always fun. I'll, if he ever calls me, even if I say I'm retired, I'd work with him. He's one of the right. people I'd work with. <laughs> I go, okay, I'll work with him. Yeah, I'll work right. with after seven, Kevin. I have to. Right. You know, because they're they're just great singers and it's easy, it's fun. It doesn't you know, it's just you have different artists for different different things that you get from them. Right. You know? So yeah. so, so Daryl, I'll ask you this then. because uh, you're kind of pointing to the fact that you might be retiring soon, if not I already. have retired. We I we did don't retire. We don't believe Last year. that. We don't believe that. Yeah, <laughs> you better believe it. All right. Well, I'm gonna. I'm you know gonna... what I say? Yeah. Listen, not to cut you off. I'm sorry, yeah. but my saying is, I'm retired until Kenny calls. There you go. <laughs> that's that's my slogan. I'm right. retired until Kenny calls. So, yeah. well, here's a better question, and, and not to dive off from what I originally was going to ask, because we'll get back to that. Have you told Ten Have you told Kenny that you've retired? 
Oh yeah, he knows. I tell him people say this about me. I say, hey, I'm done. Came go, hey, he's done. <laughs> we laugh. <laughs> Yeah, because he knows I'm done. We know each other very well. When I say oh, I'm man. done, he knows I'm done. Oh man. Yeah. But he <laughs> knows right. if he calls, yeah. I come out of retirement. There you go. <laughs> <laughs> so, but yeah, he knows. Yeah. And yeah, he gets it. Yeah. You know, he totally gets it. Yeah. You know? Yeah. So, it's cool. So, it's all good. Yeah. So in a hypothetical world, then, Daryl, aside from okay. aside from Babyface, who of course you would go back into the studio for, um, are there any other artists that you feel like if they called right now, you'd go back in? Beyonce, Usher. Yeah. Yeah, those are the two. Yeah. Yeah, Beyonce, Cause, Usher. Because it's not just about money at this point for no. you. You have all no, the no, no, not and at all. all that, but it's, it's oh, what excites it's, it's, you. Yeah. It's yeah. so what excites me. It's my relationship with those people. They're like family, like yeah. after seven. Yeah. You know, it's just, okay, what you need me to do, I'm there for you. Tony, if Tony calls, I love Tony. We love working with Tony. She knows that. Yeah. So, but yeah, that that's yeah. I could not say no. You know, be like, okay, what you need me to do? What do you want me to do? Right. You know. So, absolutely. Wow. Yeah. Amazing. Um, yeah. So, Daryl, that's all that I had for you. Amazing career. Okay. Cool. Uh, I hope it's not. I hope it's Thank not you. goodbye for 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 music for you. But I mean, I mean, we got to touch on the Christmas album. Let before we get out of here. Christmas talk. album. Yeah. Yep, uh, it was my last body of work. I've never produced a whole entire album by myself. Yeah. And I always admired Kenny for doing Exhale. I thought that was, he did an incredible job. I don't know how he did it. Yeah. You know, but <laughs> I said, wow, I wish I could do that one day where I could produce everything and write and yeah. control it. And so, and that, this is not on the same level, of course, but I love Christmas music. So I wrote and co wrote like 10 original songs, no covers. And what I what I ended up doing was using people that I've used on my records throughout my career mm. to give them an opportunity to shine. Right. You know, because I started out with my A list. Oh, I'll get Johnny Gill. I'll get Tevin Campbell. I'll get yeah. Kenny Lattimore. I'll get Kev on. I'll get Tony. I'll get SWB. And my daughter says, Daddy, that'll take you 10 years to get done. That's right. <laughs> <laughs> with, you know, with all the scheduling and everybody's all I said, well, yeah, Dariel, you're, you're right. So I said, you know, I'll give these guys a chance to shine. They've always sung background on a lot of my records, Rico Franklin, Derek Cox, Tamia. So I said, let's let them sing something lead. Let's push them out there. So it's sort of like a generic Quincy Jones type album, you know, where yeah. it's my album. I'm the artist, but this person is singing and that person is singing and I wrote and I arranged and I produced. So, and it was a lot of fun. It was a lot of fun. Everybody was here in Atlanta. It was easy. Uh, they'd leave their jobs and come to the studio six or seven. They were happy to sing. Wow. And it was a lot of fun. It, and it's a really good album. It's a really, really good album. So we're planning a bonus track <clears throat> this Christmas. Uh, I don't want to give it away yet, but it, yeah. it will be special. The bonus okay. track will be special. I'll just tell you that. Right. Uh, but a lot of, got a lot of, I got a lot of traction from it. Kenny played guitar on it. Wow. On uh, one of the songs, he played guitar for me. And uh, Paul Booten mixed it. You know, he's mixed all our records and it sounds really good. And uh, so I just worked on it like a normal project. You wow. know what I mean? Yeah. I worked really hard on it. I wrote a lot. And I really love I'm very happy with it. And it's something that I never thought I could do, but right. I wanted to do. Yeah. And so uh, it's a good project. You know, if you, if you get a chance to listen to it. It's really, it's it, it will remind you of Timeless. Mm. Because there are there are songs there that are just kind of like, dang, that could be an RB song, yeah. like a regular song. Right. You know, when you hear some when you hear some of the songs, my son said that one of his favorite songs is uh, "Try Again." Okay. He said it sounds like it could be like a regular song. Wow. You know, so I kind of took a little bit from Quincy Jones, a lot bit from Kenny, a little bit from Jimmy and Terry when they did uh, Alexander O'Neill's one of my favorite Christmas albums, probably my favorite Christmas album. I think their songwriting on that album was just same things like great right. R&B Christmas songs, Yeah, you know? And I said, I got to make sure it has that feel. It's got to be good stories. I just don't want to say Christmas words and call it a Christmas song. Yeah. You know, I want, <laughs> I, I put a lot of passion in, in the stories and the lyric. And so I borrowed a little bit from, from everybody and then put my own self into it. So I was very happy with it. Very, very happy. Yeah. So like I said, we got some ideas this, this Christmas, we're going to have a bonus track, but I don't want to, give away what it's what it's going to be yet but it'll, it'll be very cool you'll know that i told you yeah amazing 